Good evening, one and all. Welcome to those here and those who will join us via the VDS YouTube channel. The Cole Lectures were established in 1893 by Colonel E.W. Cole of Nashville to bring distinguished lecturers to the campus in, quote, defense and advocacy of the Christian religion, close quote. As we have now turned into the 21st century, we are broadening this once again to include engagement, conversation, and even shared deliberation that Christian traditions might share with other faith traditions. Among the distinguished church leaders and theologians who have delivered the Cole Lectures over the last 124 years are Harry Emerson Fosdick, Paul Tillich, H. Richard Niebuhr, Fred Craddock, Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza, Albert J. Rabateau, Gustavo Gutierrez, James Cohn, Donald Beiswinger, Ed Farley, David Buttrick, Marcus Borg, Jurgen Moltmann, Peter Gomes, Jim Wallace, James Lawson, Elaine Pagels, and Nikki Finney. This year's Cole lecturer is Dr. Daisy L. Machado, who serves as Professor of American Religious History at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Her scholarship focuses specifically on United States Christianities. She holds a BA from Brooklyn College, an MSW from Hunter College, School of Social Work, a Master of Divinity, Union Theological Seminary, New York, and a PhD from the University of Chicago. In other words, she's been around intellectually. She is the first U.S. Latina ordained in the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ, in 1981 in the Northeast region and has served inner city congregations in Brooklyn, Houston, and Fort Worth. From 1996 to 99, Dr. Machado served as the first director of the Hispanic Theological Initiative, a $3.4 million project funded by the Pew Charitable Trust to increase the presence of Latina, Latino faculty teaching in seminaries, schools of religion, and religion departments around the country. From 2002 to 6, she served as the chair of the board of the Hispanic Summer Program, an innovative master's level program currently supported by over 30 seminaries and schools of theology, of which Vanderbilt is one. In July of 2008, she was invited to serve as a chaplain for week three of the summer season at the Chautauqua Institute, making her the first Latina to serve in this capacity. Her daily sermons were preached to a gathering of over 600 participants every day. In spring 2010, she presented the keynote address for the Institute for Live Theology held at the University of San Diego, California, entitled Border Life and the Religious Imagination. Her publications include Borders and Margins, Hispanic Disciples in the Southwest, 1888 to 1942, co-editor of A Reader in Latina Feminist Theology, Religion and Justice, as well as numerous chapters in anthologies, encyclopedias, journals, and magazines. Her two latest publications are The Southern U.S. Border, Immigration and Historical Imagination and Globalization in the anthology Rethinking Economic Globalization and Voices from Inpadla. Did I come close? Inpadla, Latinas in U.S. Religious History in Feminist Intercultural Theology Latina Explorations for a Just World. She has also lectured in Mexico, Venezuela, and Germany, and has keynoted at many Disciples of Christ regional as well as church-wide disciples events. Dr. Machado is also involved 
in the early stages of a longer-term research project with Dr. Evelyn Parker of Perkins School of Theology called God Behind Bars, which seeks to investigate and interpret the religious reality of Latina and African American women inmates. A first consultation was held at Perkins in May of 2009 and a second at Union in 2010. Each consultation gathered recently released female Latina inmates as well as prison chaplains, social workers, and selected directors of church-run prison ministries to talk about religion and the religious life of incarcerated women of color. A second phase of the project will involve interviewing African American and Latina inmates who are incarcerated. A native of Cuba, she was raised in New York, lived in Texas for 20 years, and lived in Lexington, Kentucky for two years, where she served as Vice President for Academic Affairs and Dean of Lexington Theological Seminary. Dr. Machado has a great interest in the concept of borderlands, which is a multi-layered word that not only refers to a specific geographic location, but for Latinas and other women of color also refers to a social, economic, political, and personal location within the dominant culture. She is also a strong advocate for a comprehensive reformation of current U.S. immigration laws, especially now that Arizona has enacted Senate Bill 1070. Her co-lectures for this year are drawn from these interests. Her title for these two lectures, Of Marginal Identities and Heterotopic Saints, Lived Religion in the Borderlands. When Dr. Machado is done, and we have had a moment or two of question and answer, I invite you to join us just that way down the hall to the reading room for a reception. For now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Daisy Machado to Vanderbilt and to the Divinity School as we engage in vibrant conversation that begins tonight and continues tomorrow. Buenas noches. Good evening. After listening to the Dean's introduction, I realized that what I tell my students is very true. You always need to behave yourself because you never know who's watching. Thank you, Emily, for, for sharing that information. As you can tell, the theme of Borderlands has been for me a very important one. It is one that I started when I was doing my doctoral studies and one that I have continued and developed and put away and, took and taken up again. And in these last few years, I realized how relevant it is and since November of last year, how important it is for us to really take a look at what is going on in the U.S. borderlands. So once again, good evening. It is both an honor and a pleasure for me to join this community this year as a year speaker for the Cole Lectures. The lectures were described to me as including all forms of thoughtful reflection upon topics of Christian faith and practice. And I think that given all the things that are currently going on in this country, I am sure that we can agree that there is indeed much to give thoughtful reflection to. So I want to invite you in these lectures to join me for closer consideration of just one slice of that landscape by more carefully and intentionally examining the realities of the U.S. Latinx borderlands and to also examine the role that religion plays for the community that occupies this contested space. As a Latina, as an immigrant, as someone who came to this country as a three-year-old child, 
As an immigrant whose family came to the United States, fleeing not only poverty but also dictatorship, as a naturalized citizen, as an ordained minister, and as a seminary professor, it seems to me that all my life I have had to explain myself. That is, to tell those outside my community why I was here, which in many ways, depending on what part of the country I was living in at the time, was a sort of defense of my presence in this country. I quickly learned as a child in elementary school in New York City that I did not really belong when in the fourth grade, public school, my teacher punished me and had me stand before the class to apologize for speaking Spanish to the only other Latina child in the classroom. As she told me, I needed to apologize for speaking that nasty language. In so many ways, despite the academic degrees earned, the leadership I have provided in both my denomination and in the Theological Academy, I remain, as so many in my community remain, marginal, and am often still treated as such. Surely and sadly, this experience is not unique to me. The unfortunate, reali the unfortunate reality is that for millions of Latinx that, that, that live in the United States today, we are a community under siege. A fact made clear when during the past presidential campaign in June of 2016, there was an attack that repeatedly, dis where dis repeatedly disparaging words were issued, stated against Mexican Americans and the, Mexicans, the Mexican community when they were called drug dealers, criminals, and rapists. I suppose the same could have been said about any of our Latinx communities, which is a reflection I think of the disdain, the nativism, the racism, and the lack of concern for Latinx living in the United States that so many in our own government and in our society harbor. These sentiments were one again, once again manifested when the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, known as DACA, was rescinded in early September, effectively leaving the future of the 800,000 so-called dreamers in a precarious and anxiety riddled limbo. These realities were the catalyst for Pulitzer Prize winning author Junot Diaz, who was brought by his parents to, from Santo Domingo to New Jersey when he was six years old, to write an essay for the New Yorker magazine in November of 2016. I want to share with you tonight a portion of that essay, which I think helps us to really begin to lay a foundation for the kind of thoughtful reflection upon topics of Christian faith and practice that I want us to engage in in these lectures as we examine the Latinx reality in 2017. I just want to make a comment about the slides. Those of you that have, I didn't know exactly the size of where the screen and all of that, so some of you that are further away may not be able to read, and I have just taken sections of the lecture and put them up because I wanted to really emphasize them. But don't worry if you can't really see them because I'm going to be reading them. So, so you listen and we'll be fine. Okay, me oyeron. Everybody cool? All right, good. But let me share this with that you know Diaz said. Oops. Did it? Yes. Querida Ku, I hope that you are feeling, if not precisely better, then at least not so demoralized. On Wednesday, after he won, you reached out to me seeking advice, solidarity. You wrote, my two little sisters called me weeping this morning. I had nothing to give them. I felt bereft. What now? Keep telling the truth from an ever-shrinking corner? Give up? I answered immediately because you are my hermana, because it hurt me so much that it hurt me so much to hear you in such distress. I offered some consoling words, but the truth was, I didn't know what to say. To you, to my godchildren who all year had been having nightmares that their parents would be deported, to myself. So what now? Well, first and foremost, we need to feel. We need to connect courageously with the rejection, the fear, the vulnerability that Trump's victory has inflicted on us without turning away or numbing ourselves or lapsing into cynicism. We need to bear witness to what we have lost, our safety, our sense of belonging, our vision for our country. We need to mourn all these injuries fully so that they do not drag us into despair, so repair will be possible. 
For those of us who have been in the fight, the prospect of more fighting has, after, after such cruel setback will seem impossible. But I believe that once the shock settles, faith and energy will return because, let's be real, we always knew this wasn't going to be easy. We have to keep fighting because otherwise there will be no future. All will be consumed. This is the joyous destiny of our people, to bury the ark of the moral universe so deep in justice that we will never be undone. But all the fighting in the world will not help us if we do not also hope. What I'm trying to cultivate is not blind optimism, but what the philosopher Jonathan Lear calls radical hope. What makes this hope radical, Lear writes, is that it is directed towards a future goodness that transcends the current ability to understand what it is. Radical hope is not so much something you have, but something you practice. It demands flexibility, openness, and what Lear describes as imaginative excellence. Radical hope is our best weapon against despair, even when despair seems justifiable. It makes the survival of the end of our world possible. Only radical hope could have imagined people like us into existence. I want you to hear this last statement again. Only radical hope could have imagined people like us into existence. And this is what I want us to reflect upon in these lectures. Who is this Latinx community living in the U.S. borderland? And what the, what the practice of radical hope looks like for one segment of that community? We're going to do this by using the lens of lived religion found in the Latinx borderland and the role it plays as a way to provide meaning of expressing hope of even promoting resistance. Since I have two opportunities to share with you, in tonight's lecture, I will lay out the landscape of the Latinx borderlands, first defining the term, and then closely examining two key issues for this community. The first is identity, and the second is citizenship. In defining this borderlands, I will use Foucault's concept of heterotopia, which I think provides a very interesting lens with which to think about borderlands and borderlands people. My lecture tomorrow morning, I'm going to use Santa Muerte, a very provocative, a non-orthodox saint, as a case study to help us analyze how the reality of a marginal existence produces ways of understanding and relating to the divine that are often not only unexpected, but may also even be perceived as unorthodox, disturbing, and even interpreted as transgressing behavior, despite the fact that these very beliefs and practices provide a way to find hope and maintain hope to people that are marginalized and rejected with, other, with little other places to do this. So let me begin. The borderlands defining. There are countless ways to define and to understand and to interpret the idea of borderlands. We can say that the borderlands are places of constant motion where identity, language, economics, religious belief, and politics are in flux. We can also say that borders and the cultures that develop in this border reality can be called a heterotopia. The idea of heterotopia was developed by Michel Foucault in a lecture he gave in 1967, where his outlines of heterotopia attempt to explain principles and features of a range of cultural, institutional, and discursive spaces that are somehow different, disturbing, intense, incompatible, contradictory, and transforming. Foucault's heterotopias display and inaugurate a difference and challenge the space in which we may feel at home. These emplacements exist out of step and meddle with our sense of interiority. There is no pure form of heterotopia, but different combinations, each reverberating with all the others. Unlike utopias, Foucault understood a heterotopia to be localized and be in a real space that can also change at different stages of history and can reflect the changing attitudes of society. Surely, Gloria Saldúa captures the contradictions and the disturbing or out-of-step nature of the borderlands as a heterotopia when she describes in her book, Borderlands La Frontera, 
the uniqueness of border culture, the border culture by, by saying this. The U.S. Oops, did I skip one? No. All right. Uh-oh. All right. Sorry, my own little confusion there. The U.S. border culture, she says, es una herida abierta, an open wound, where the third world grates against the first and bleeds. And before a scab forms, it hemorrhages again, the lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. Borders are set up to define the spaces that are safe and unsafe, to distinguish us from them, a borderland is a vague, undetermined place created by emotional residue of an unnatural bounty. It is, an, it, is, is it, it is in a constant state of transition. This reality is further developed by novelist Alejandro Morales, who reminds us of the, of the following. We live in a time and space in which borders, both literal and figurative, exist everywhere. Borders are made of concrete, asphalt, aluminum, barbed wire, and water, which mark the dividing line of one community in relationship to another and mark the demographic, the racial, the ethnic, economic, and political separation of people. These are the physical borders of heterotopia. Metaphorical borders are symbolized by the division and limits of culture, language, food, traditions, influence, and power. Psychological borders are manifested in metaphors of fear, desire, love, and hatred. We know that a border maps limits. It keeps people in and out of an area. It marks the ending of a, of a safe zone and the beginning of an unsafe zone. To confront a border, and more so to cross a border, presumes great risk. In general, people are afraid to cross borders. People will cling to the dream of utopia and fail to recognize that they now live in a heterotopia. And so the borderlands becomes, as described by Ansaldúa, that emotional residue of an unnatural boundary, a place that is unsafe, a place that is disturbing, filled with contradictions, a place where the desired utopia, which is the dream of El Norte, the dream of America, is shattered and instead becomes a heterotopia. That is why the image of people running desperately across the border, heading north, journeying to utopia, utopia, but discovering heterotopia, illuminates much of the landscape that we Latinx people inhabit. And this is the important reality we cannot, we cannot ignore in 2017. For many Latinx living in the US, the encounter between their histories, religions, languages, and the dominant culture no longer occur mostly in the peripheries, but instead these encounters that disrupt and interrupt also happen in the large urban areas of this nation, as well as the rural towns of the heartland, where we must also acknowledge the idea of a borderland that is not only truly heterotopic, but is no longer confined to only the Southwest or to California. The reality is that the borderlands in 2017 are no longer delineated nor contained by the almost 2,000 mile border that runs from Brownsville, Texas to San Diego, California. These borderlands can also be found in Washington Heights in New York City, where the majority of Dominicanos live. It is found in Elizabeth, New Jersey, where 42% of the population is Latinx or Las Vegas, or where Las Vegas, where 31% of the population is Latinx, and even in Aurora, Illinois, where 42% of the population is Latinx. These demographic shifts that have reconfigured the map of the borderlands only reinforce how simplistic, how incorrect, and often misinformed most non-Latinx are about the borderlands and about the people who live there. However, this inability to understand, which in many ways is an inability to see and to recognize, is also made clear in how invisible and marginal Latinx continue to be in this nation. Consider 
the marginality and invisibility of the current disaster in Puerto Rico that, that this island has endured after being hit by Hurricane Maria. This hurricane not only made landfall cutting across the center of the island on September 19th, but was the worst hurricane to hit Puerto Rico since 1932. The New York Times in an article dated September 26th showed that a group of, of a group of people surveyed only 54% knew that Puerto Ricans were U.S. citizens. And of those surveyed between the ages of 18 to 29, only 37% knew this. So why does this matter? Because just like the numerous times that I have been ha I've had to respond to the question almost all Latinx are asked, um, so where are you from? Due to the basic assumption that I'm not from here, so too inaccurate beliefs held by U.S. citizens impact the support of, of cuts to foreign aid when asked to evaluate spending priorities. The New York Times polls show that support for additional aid was strongly associated with knowledge of the citizenship status of Puerto Ricans, borderlands, who's in, who's out, who gets help, and who doesn't, the citizen, the non-citizen. These are the binaries that are at work when we talk about these identities. More than eight in 10 Americans who know Puerto Ricans are citizens support aid, compared with only four in 10 of those who do not. The fact that the, the government, the federal government, has offered little in ways of public, political, or economic support for Puerto Rico not only shows a lack of empathy that is just staggering, but as we do this analysis, as we think about the borderlands, it's ultimately not surprising. And though Puerto Ricans have been U.S. citizens since 1917, and even though Mexican Americans have lived in what is today the United States for perhaps five or six generations, as Fernando Segovia has clearly stated, Latinos are the eternal other. In 2017, we are still identified as interlopers and foreigners, and that we have all come illegally to steal from the bounteous table that is the United States. Given this reality, the question that we next need to ask is, so who are the Latinx living in the borderlands? Who are the Latinx living in the Tennessee borderlands? Do you know them? To talk about the U.S. Latinx community is to talk about a very large and very diverse population group that, I, that as I have said, remains mostly invisible and marginal in so many ways. So to help us better identify who we are talking about, I want us to first consider the following demographic data. Latinx in the United States were about 57.5 million people, representing 18% of the total population. And interestingly enough, 63% of all Latinx are Mexican or Mexican origin. 34% of Latinx are foreign born and come from 17 countries in the Western Hemisphere, making the Latinx population very diverse racially and ethnically. 89% of U.S. Latinx born here speak English proficiently, and a growing segment of second and third generation Latinx don't even speak Spanish at all. The U.S. Latinx population is also a young population where the average age is 28 compared to Anglo-Americans where the average age is 43. 65% of the U.S. Latinx population was born in the United States. This means that Latinx are now more likely to be born in this country and raised in this country, making them truly full-blooded U.S. citizens. Latinx are also the nation's largest immigrant group and one of its fastest growing populations and recent studies show this is due to births, not immigration, which is a significant demographic change from the past years. But of course, statistical information cannot really tell the story of a people because there is always so much more. Identity, we know, is a social creation and as such undergoes change. And this has been and continues to be an important part of the Latinx experience that needs to be carefully looked at. So I want to now focus on the first important issue that I told you about, which is identity. So how do I tell the story of the Latinx people living in the United States? For example, does one begin in the Southwest, 
telling the story of those who lived in territories occupied by the Spanish long before the arrival of the settlers of Jamestown or those who traveled on the Mayflower? Or is this history one that really begins after the Mexican-American War in 1848, in which about half of what were Mexican territories, about 500,000 square miles, were incorporated into the United States, creating a political and a geographical border that absorbed Spanish-speaking populations and created a landscape that at the same time made the United States a world power in the 19th century. Do we begin there? Then we had the Spanish-American War in 1898, which not only produced the annexation of Puerto Rico, but also sowed the seeds for the great mi migration of Cubans more than 65 years later, who, through, who though freed from Spanish yoke, were now controlled by the interventionist policies of the United States. The 1980s brings the next great wave of Latinx to the United States, this time from Central America, especially El Salvador and Nicaragua, driven by the violence of revolution, poverty, unemployment, and Ronald Reagan's Contra Wars, which were in reality really an attack against the Cold War enemy of communism. In the 1990s, it was a great wave of immigrants from the Dominican Republic, from Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, and other countries in South America, as the southern continent faced unemployment and economic instability. It would seem that the history of Latinx in the United States is one that has been shaped by waves of violence, waves of poverty, waves of interventionism, neoliberalism, failed economic policies, isolation, it can never, and so this history, because of this history, because this is the way this history has played out, it cannot be told in isolation. It is never just the history of los mexicanos, los puertorriqueños, los cubanos, los ecuatorianos, no. The history of Latinx in the United States is a history about the micro and the macro of the Latinx experience. It is about the history of a specific and unique Latinx group, but it is also about how that one group, whether Mexican or Cuban or Peruvian or Dominican, becomes a part of that larger bundle of relationships that is the Latinx community in this nation. We may indeed be the eternal other. However, for many Latinx, especially those of us raised here, we come to another discovery. No somos de aquí, Ni somos de allá. We are not from here, but we are not from there. We are truly a borderlands people who seem to occupy a third space between cultures. In my case, between the Cuban culture I was born into on the island and then the United States culture where I was raised, educated, and which has become my reality. The borderlands is for many of us our only true home that heterotopia where life for the Latinx is lived as a stranger to non-Latinos and often even to yourself. The Latinx community in North America is both citizen and foreigner. It has been conquered and colonized. The Latinx community in the United States is an imagined community, and by this I mean a community that has been created or imagined by those outside our community. If you have listened to the history I have shared with you, about the various waves that brought our people into the United States, then you will have noticed that this history is about belonging and not belonging, about centers and margins, about national identity and national rejection, about how others, those who are not Latinx, see my community, how they see me, how you see me, about my identity and about how my identity and existence are interpreted in the, um, in the United States, in the Americas, for over 200 years. It seems as if we, the Latinx in the United States, embody a series of contradictions that evoke from those in the mainstream, in the government, in this culture as a whole, sometimes surprise, sometimes anger, sometimes disapproval, sometimes rejection. That is why the history of the Latinx community in the United States is the history where the country we migrate from does not matter. Nor does it matter if we are born here, because once we enter, once we are identified as coming from a country south of the border, 
we undergo a false baptism, which gives us a new name and an unwelcome identity. We become Hispanic. We are an imagined people, in many ways a fiction of the dominant culture. The power of imagination in the production of history must be examined if we are to engage in the work for racial justice in my community. Because it is this imagination, historical imagination, that has produced the language and has created the identities of non-white communities in this nation in an effort to exclude and control those same communities. This imagination, of course, is not new. And it has been at work in this nation since its inception. As Europeans tried to understand who the Native Americans were, this is just one example, and from which developed for the imagination of these Native Americans as an imposed imagined identities that not only justified their extermination via government military action, but led to their eventual placement on reservations. Here is an early example of this imagination at work. I'm going to read for you from the 1600s a letter about how the Native Americans had come to America. In 1634, letters from the well-known theologian Joseph Mead to New England ministers suggested that Indians had migrated to the Americans because the devil had led them here. His logic was simple, I imagine very simple. The devil was afraid of losing his dominance in Europe as the gospel spread. This had provoked the devil to gather together the hordes of barbarous, barbarous northerners who had never heard of Christ, and the devil promised them an empty land superior to their own where they might thrive in a kingdom ruled by the devil. Simple enough. Thinking about this power of imagination in the creation of identities, the well-known Mexican novelist Carlos Fuentes is reputed to have said, the United States has no history, it only has the movies. What he is saying is that within the national consciousness of the dominant United States society, there are images and stories that have dissembled a history, particularly of racial ethnic communities. And what is left is called this historical imaginary, which for the Latinx community are the stories about those that the dominant cultures considers, identifies, defines as aliens, misfits, and interlopers. I can tell you that personal experience has taught me that being Latinx or Hispanic can mean very different things depending on where you live in the United States, who is looking at you and who is defining you. For example, in some parts of the country, the only thing that people see, people see of Latinos or Hispanics are political exiles. In other parts of the country, all people can see and define are wetbacks, illegals, criminals, let's arrest them, let's put them in jail. In other parts of the country, all people can see is a community riddled with crime, high drug use, gang bangers, and need also to be controlled. And yet in other parts of the country, we are little more than the arms that pick the fruits or vegetables that grace our tables or prepare the chickens that we find in the supermarket. Yet in all of these different communities, we share this one identity, that we are not meant to be here, that we are not really American, that we are interlopers who want to usurp the economic opportunities of those real Americans, those defined as white and who hold citizenship. And while much of this has to do with the U.S.'s own ambivalence towards immigrants dating back to the big migrations from Eastern Europe and the Mediterranean in the 1800s, it also has much to do with the great difficulty the United States has always had dealing with and engaging its southern and closest neighbors in the Caribbean, in Mexico, Central America, all the way down to Patagonia in Argentina. History clearly shows how the U.S. has looked upon the southern neighbors as needing to be improved, needing to be Americanized, but rarely treated as equals. This is especially so in much of the missionary literature where you read about the need to uplift these populations because they were, they were so alien, so different from the American ideal. Again, Think about how this embedded idea of the United States exceptionalism has played out in diplomatic relations with its southern neighbors, 
producing a long history of paternalistic interventions which continue to be played out in the Latinx community living within the United States today, which is why I think it is important to consider the term so commonly used to talk about me and my community, the term Hispanic. The term Hispanic must be critically examined in order to better understand the implications of the historical legacy that the Latinx community must deal with today. In reality, Hispanic is not a racial or cultural or geographic or linguistic or economic description. Hispanic is a bureaucratic integer, a complete political fiction that in the 1970s was created by the federal government and then adopted by the Census Bureau. Hispanics, by the way, do not exist in any other place in the world but here. There are no Hispanics in Mexico, hate to tell you, no Hispanics in Cuba, none in Santo Domingo, none in any of the countries. However, when a Mexicano, Dominicano, Boliviano, Guatemalteco arrives to the U.S., they immediately become Hispanic. And the result is clear. Hispanics have been continually imagined as other, foreigner, non-native, even if that Latinx person was born in the United States. The term Hispanic has also served to make the diverse Latinx population in this country, has made them into an indistinguishable and mostly invisible mass of outsiders. I mentioned briefly that life in the borderland means for the Latinx person to become a stranger to others and even to themselves. And I want to unpack, unpack that a little bit more for you. The inhabitants of this borderlands, of this heterotopia, are rendered strangers to each other and themselves. Crossing the border, heading north, the Mexican, or pick any Latinx uh, well, Latinx nation where we come from, is immediately separated from the point of origin, from the genesis of identity. The individual moving north is separated, cut off from the motherland. Here the stranger must struggle to make themselves at home. Here the stranger must struggle, must struggle to identify themselves, to define themselves, to explain and to understand themselves. Life in the chaos of heterotopia is a perpetual act of self-definition, gradually deterritorializing the individual. The individual becomes an ambiguity, trapped in the process of self-definition that splinters and shatters their identity. No doubt this ambiguity, this constant questioning of who we are and do we belong, has a profound impact on our community and especially on our children and our youth. I can identify with this struggle as an adolescent and a young adult when I visited Cuba with my father for the first time since arriving in the New York City at the age of three. During that visit to Cuba, it became crystal clear to me that I was not really Cuban, that I had nothing in common with my cousins who were my own age, that my grandfather and grandmother and my uncles didn't even know me. I was a stranger to my family, I was a stranger to Cuba. I also continue to see this struggle, this ambiguity every single summer at the Hispanic Summer Program, where the wounds, where the wounds that our Latinx seminarians carry from years of having to find life and joy and value in this trap of self-definition, of ambiguity, and more often than not, rejection must be handled, must be dealt with, must be responded to. A rejection, by the way, that many of them have found even in their seminary classrooms. So the question before us tonight, as a theological community concerned with the common good, with a biblical text that challenges us to love mercy and do justice, the question that I believe that we must grapple with is how do we work for racial justice within a community that is 57 million strong and yet does not fit into the historical and racial understandings of the black-white dichotomy, which is still seen as the legitimate racial categories for the nation. If Hispanics are not Caucasian and not black, then what does racial justice look like for my community? How can Latinx really become a part of this nation's conversation on racial equality? How do Latinx work with our sisters and brothers in the African-American community to change the racial discourse and open it up for other racial ethnic persons? And as an educator, 
I think we also need to grapple with the question of how do we provide the kind of support and mentoring that our wonderful and talented Latinx youth need so they can survive and thrive in the heterotopia that is the borderlands. And this issue of identity is connected directly with the second one that I want you now to think about with me, which is citizenship. Identity and citizenship. The location of the southern U.S. border with northern Mexico was settled with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 and the Gadsden Purchase in 1853. But long before there was a border, Native American communities had settlements in the areas between the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Ocean. However, the southern border was always porous, and there was a great growth in the border population, especially during the period of the Mexican Revolution in 1910, in which refugees from several central Mexican states migrated to Texas and established pi patterns of migration that were eventually made criminal, eventually made illegal, when investors, ranchers, miners, railroad builders saw the potential for making money in the once ignored border territory. Therefore, it is not surprising that by the 1930s, a border patrol apparatus, a border patrol apparatus had been established, deeply embedded, and today this force is a strong and well-equipped military force known as ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, which is a part of the Department of Homeland Security, which in 2016 had a budget of $64.8 billion. And I want to briefly mention here a reality that is so often ignored when talking about illegality and the border, which is that particularly for Mexicans, the illegality of Mexicans is ultimately sustained by legal interventions. And a quick example is NAFTA. When NAFTA was written, all kinds of provisions were made for legally crossing goods across the border, but no provisions were ever made for legally moving workers across the border. What this means is that the illegality of Mexicans who come to the United States, as well as the more recent migration of other immigrants from Spanish-speaking countries to the south of the United States, is created by a series of legal political tactics that have racialized Mexi Mexican migrants as illegal aliens, as invasive violators of the law, incorrigible foreigners, subverting the integrity of the nation and its sovereignty from within the space of the U.S. nation state. The key issue here is the intersection of race and space. This is an unwanted race of people who are infringing upon the sacred space of the nation state. We saw these same patterns rise up with, and used again uh, with people with the Middle East after the events of 9-11. However, for Mexicans who saw the border of the United States cross over and consume former Mexican lands in 1848, the creation of the U.S. Border Patrol in 1924 meant dealing with a distinctive special police force that quickly engaged in the repression of Mexican workers in the United States. During the presidential campaign, candidate Trump cited Eisenhower's deportations of Mexicans in 1954 as a program to emulate. These deportations, called Operation Wetback, represented the second wave of deportation of Mexicans by the U.S. government. During the Depression in the 1930s, two million Mexicans and Mexican-Americans were deported when white workers felt that they were taking their jobs. This was repeated at the end of World War II when facing the returns of tens of thousands of servicemen, President Truman ordered an inquiry that eventually placed much of the blame for the country's social ills at the time on illegal immigration. President Eisenhower took over from Truman by unveiling Operation Wetback, which deported more than one million Mexicans and Mexican-Americans, devastating Mexican-American families, disrupting businesses in Mexican neighborhoods, and fanning inter-ethnic animosities throughout the border region. Some were deported by ship, causing the death of 88 men due to sunstroke, and many were taken over the border in cattle trucks 
and unloaded 15 miles from the U.S. border in the desert and left to find their way home. If this is the model that is lifted up as one to emulate, then it is clear to see why the U.S. borderlands remain a true heterotopia, which, as Foucault argued, inverts, contests, suspends, and neutralizes the utopia of U.S. citizenship, leading to the realization there is no place for Latinx immigrants to find the kind of belonging that citizenship offers, because even when they become citizens, Latinx have historically retained the identity of stranger and foreigner and can be deported. For sociologist Renato Rosaldo, the way force is deployed at the border expresses dominant Anglo-cultural views of limited Latino rights to full U.S. citizenship. So for the Latinx community, the work of racial justice must include this analysis of the meaning of citizenship, of the meaning of belonging, and also of the obstacles to that belonging. Keep in mind that there is a common desire and concern within the Latinx community to be visible, to be heard, to belong. However, as long as the Latinx community is considered a problem, labeled a problem, by politicians, by lawmakers, um, then the, the, the Latinx community will never be seen as a people with agency, a people with goals, with perceptions, with a purpose of their own. We will continue to be defined as, and imagined as aliens and undeserving of citizenship. What I want to say in conclusion tonight is that the work for racial justice in the Latino community is indeed complex and multi-layered, and one that requires that the issues of imagination, of the historical imagination, which is about the racialization of Latinx, as well as the issues of citizenship rights, and also need to be part of this struggle. We must dismantle the imagination that continues to reinforce the idea that Latinx don't belong, that we are not equal, and we do not deserve the rights and protections granted to the white citizens of this country. Just consider that in 2015, the district attorney of Gaston County, North Carolina, refused to certify a domestic violence survivor's visa application because he argued that the relevant law protecting crime victims was never intended to protect Latinos from Latinos. Hermanos y hermanos, sisters and brothers, my neighbors, esta es la lucha. This is our struggle. If we interpret and understand that the borderlands Latinx inhabit is a heterotopia, then we can better understand that life in the borderlands is about living in a frontier that runs through your tongue, your religion, your dress, your food, your architecture, your appearance, and life and that manifests itself in multiple ontologies that call for the acquisition of new survival habits. So tomorrow I'm going to take these themes and continue them. And I will, I will explore with you the practices that represent survival. I will explore with you practices that represent ways to hope, ways to continue living in a heterotopia that are embodied, in this case, by the practice of one particular sector of the Latinx population living in this country and also living in Mexico. Tomorrow, for those of you who don't know her, I'm going to introduce you to Santa Muerte. And together we will look at how this saint is not only true at home in heterotopia, not only is she a borderland saint, but why it is that she appeals to so many struggling every day to survive in the borderlands in 2017. I hope that you will join me tomorrow as we get to know La Blanca Señora, La Señora Blanca, La Huesuda, Santa Muerte. Thank you very much. Comments or questions? I think I packed a little bit too much, no? <laughs> There's just so much to say. Are any questions or comments? Wait until you meet Santa Muerte tomorrow. <laughs> yes.
Thank you very much for what you have shared with us. As a gringa who has lived most of her life in different Latin American countries, in fact, my whole childhood was in Matanzas, Cuba, mm -hmm. um, I'm obviously very much interested in what you have shared and the importance of the Latino and ex, we hadn't heard that, my husband's Mexican, we hadn't heard that term before yet here in the States. Um, part of being and living in a borderland, as you have pointed out, entails many things. Fear, struggle, not being recognized as part of mm -hmm. the country that you've lived in and often have been born in. Mm -hmm. But strength comes in unity. And if we only look at the Latino part of things, right. there are an awful lot of other bordered right. groups within the United States. That is correct historical, and more recent. So how can we learn to value each other and give importance to this same reality that as Latinos we live, mm -hmm. but that affects so many other right. communities? Right. And, and do this within a faith tradition that says we are all children of God, and we all are called to love our neighbor as ourselves and the foreigner that lives in our midst, but not by defining these people in these created borderlands by an Anglo community that sees the so-called minorities as a danger. Right. So, well, there's more things I yeah, could say, no. but I think you've got enough there. Yeah, thank you very much for that, because I wanted that something that I, what well, was a comment I was, going, I was going to make is, I don't think that the borderlands are specifically a Latinx reality. I think that they're shared across, all of us are border crossers. We cross borders every single day in different ways. That's not, that's not unique to us, it's not that we have patented that and oh, 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 that's not what I'm saying. However, for the Latinx, 57 million people, it is a reality that I think goes unanswered, that continues to cause a certain, a certain disease within the community. And part of that, I think, has to do with the way that we have also been taught to be in this nation. I think that part of what this issue of why we don't understand the connection, first of all, we don't know our history. So we don't realize how much we share. We don't know how much we share. For example, you really can't talk about slavery unless you talk about the death of the indigenous populations in the Americas. One produces the other. You know, so, but to know those connections mean that I have a way of seeing ourselves involved in a common human struggle for equality for all of us. So that's one thing. The other thing is I also think that the individualism that we are embedded with in this nation in which we look at our group first, my, my group, whether it be family, whatever my tribe is, prevents us also from understanding the needs. And this is also a Latino reality. Because many Latino communities, when they come together here, which they haven't done in the same way in Latin America or the Caribbean, have a problem with that. And I think it's symptomatic of what the, how society itself plays itself out. Now, the Christian piece is interesting. Because as I, you know, I'm part of a seminary community, an ordained minister, I do have, and that appeals to me, this call to, for us to see ourselves created in a common image with a common goal of justice and mercy. However, we have a shifting religious landscape as well. So that more and more Latinos, just to talk about our community, are not Christians. Now they're involved, which is my interest in Santa Muerte, in a whole other kind of religious activity and religious way of understanding that we as a Christian community either reject, we condemn, but we don't engage. So that's the other step. How do we get to that? Afro-Caribbean religions. I find it interesting that we are very much, I'll give an example of my own seminary, and you, you can call up the president and tell her I said so, but we do a, a lot of conversations around um, interreligious dialogue. But it's always with partners that are Buddhists or Muslims or Jews, right? Never with Afro-Caribbeans, never with indigenous practitioners, never with those groups that are growing in our community, that have been present in our community, but that we 
in the mainstream, including myself, don't have, really haven't taken the chance to understand. So I think that we're fighting against that. We're fighting against not knowing, we're fighting against individualism, we're fighting against fear, because there is an element of fear that is transmitted. So all of those pieces work against us. That's why I think that an analysis has to be done. Really, has to be done, has to be, and I think seminaries can help in kind of setting an agenda for these interracial conversations, for these conversations that open up a borderland space. And to do this, it is not easy. It is not easy. Que no se puede hacer? No can do it. It's just that who, with what strength and with what resources. So that's, you know, and I see myself in that. You know, how do, we, how do we do that? How do I do that with my students? How do I do that with my classes? You know, I do a Borderlands course where I take my students to the border in Texas. and We spend days there looking at the reality of what's going on. And it's a difficult course. And, you know, and, and sometimes even the funding for that becomes difficult. So how do we do these different things? And how do I invite my other colleagues to realize that they too can help to contribute as biblical scholars, as ethicists, as historians, as theologians. They can also contribute to expanding this conversation, which for many of them is not even important. That's the other thing you st I, I struggle with personally. So thank you for the question. I was really appalled at the lack of uh, humanitarian outreach for the victims of the hurricane and began really then to, to delve into exactly what is the relationship between the U.S. and this possession that we call Puerto Rico. Yeah. And my question has to do with what we do about the so-called debt and is there a pathway towards statehood that might in some fashion uh, work against or yeah. work for this idea of citizenship in a fashion that could perhaps cut to the chase, as we yeah. used to say in North Carolina. You know, that economic piece is very complicated, and I do not, I can barely balance a budget sometimes, so I'm not going to go there. Uh, but yes, the issue of Puerto Rico's debt is indeed being played up all the time here. But that, that debt is not just because Puerto Ricos and Puerto Ricans are bad managers. There's other banking policies and other things that are really involved in all of this. The World Bank, all of the other you know, organizations that also were part of what happened in Puerto Rico, that the terrible destruction, economic destruction has led to. But I think that what even complicates that more is this status that Puerto Rico has. What is, what is this? What is Puerto Rico? No es república, it's not a, what is it? And I think that the other part of it is that the kind of, and I, and I want to stress this again, U.S. policy and U.S. relations with its southern neighbors and Caribbean neighbors has really been really not, thought, not well thought out and really filled with paternalism and all kinds of ideas about people. And I think that, you know, we have to look at how Puerto Ricans themselves have been, been impacted by this. How they themselves have been, in many ways, imprisoned by this pseudo, I don't even want to call it, identity. That they're citizens, they can't vote for the president, but they can serve in the army. You know, they, they can get benefits. They're often the first recruited along the border. There are many Puerto Ricans, Border Patrol, because they're citizens. But it sets up a dynamic that is deadly. You know, Latinos, it's just deadly. When I take my, last year, January, took my students to a detention hearing. And you really get a sense of these guards. You know, Puerto Ricanos there, you, the, the, what, the violence that has gone on, they see it. They're, they're, sometimes they'll, they'll talk to you privately, many of them won't, but they'll share with you their own ambiguity of, ¿Qué hago? What am I doing here? So all of that, and I think the psychological toll is one that we also need to look at. So I don't know what's going to happen to Puerto Rico. I don't know what the decision or the solution will be. Uh, but I know that what it's done is created this tension, very deep tension, in a time when Puerto Rico is the most vulnerable. And so, I don't know. I know that's not a good answer, but hey, I guess all I got. And I, and I worry about, you know, this kind of situation. I worry about my Puerto Rican students in class who were desperate. I mean, the depression has gone on and the worrying about parents. And one of my students said, I want to leave. I said, don't leave. What are you going to leave to? You don't even know if your parents, where they are. I mean, is that kind of, who, do, who studies like that? Who can concentrate on their work when they're living with this tension of their reality that is so, so, so marginal? And I think that's an important one. So thank you for your question. 
Thank you for that presentation. And I, I just remembered as you were talking about the shifting nature of the U.S.-Mexico border, my students and I were sitting in a migrant shelter in Mexico with someone who'd just been deported from Detroit. He was a mover in Detroit. His name was Jesus, and he said to us, I didn't cross the border, the border crossed me. <laughs> yeah. That's why I put up that map, so you would have a sense of how much the border crossed. It's, it's in, when you look at that map, you, so my students usually go, wow. Because usually we're used to thinking, oh, no, it, it, was, it was the border crossed. And then, of course, Guadalupe Hidalgo, who had Article 10 protecting citizenship, so gave the Mexicans who were in that territory citizenship, was the first thing that Congress got rid of. So Congress ratified the treaty on the condition that Article 10 would be removed taking away immediately from the start the protection of citizenship rights to the people living in those areas. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I work in the area of pastoral care and counseling here at the Divinity School and in my work as a pastoral counselor. And what comes to mind is the liminal phase of a place of not being in or out. That dual, uh, carrying that all the time. And maybe you'll speak about this tomorrow, but you know, practices of how, what kind of practices you work with with your students, what you recommend for yeah. congregational members, for all of us who want to give good support to people right. who live in liminal places, and the kind yeah. of toll it takes psychologically, spiritually, yeah. and physically, economically. Yeah. Yeah. If you'd speak to that, maybe you're going to do that tomorrow. So. Well, I'm going to talk about Santa Muerte as a practice for the community, but we'll, we, we can get to some of that. But I just want to say the following in terms of sharing with you a personal kind of, of um, a reality. I do not write about Cuba because I can't. Write about Mexico, Nicaragua, Russia. I cannot write about Cuba. And it's taken me years, even to recognize that in myself, because it's been so painful that I am not from there, but I'm not from here. And, I'm, and I remember when I started teaching in Texas, and are there any Texans here? All right, then, oh, well, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna say this. Texas never fails to disappoint. And one of the things that I, in my earlier teaching encounters, was a student who told me as a compliment, wow, I really could understand your English. So the expectation that I would talk like Ricky Ricardo, I don't know what he was expecting, but that kind of thing, you know. Um, a student who told me to get back on my banana boat and go back to where I came from. You know, so it's these kind of experiences. And I, and I know that I'm old, but I'm not from the 1800s. That happened in Texas <laughs> maybe 15 years ago. So I mean, I'm not talking about hundreds of years ago. But what that tells us is that there is this constant dealing with this apology for why I'm here, why I'm your teacher. How did you get a PhD? That kind of thing. And it takes a toll. We talk about many aggressions. We talk about all those things. You know, the, it takes a toll on you, yes. And I think that it's important. I, I talked about the Hispanic Summer Program, and I'm, which uh, Vanderbilt is a part of. But one of the issues we deal with every single summer is how wounded the students are. How wounded they are because they find that, th that they can't be heard in a way that allows them to be intellectually vibrant. And they have to often in class participate in ways that are artificial and inauthentic to them. So, you know, there are many ways to think of doing it, and, and, and I think that there are ways that seminaries can think about having different kinds of workshops to address issues of vocation and calling and those kinds of things. But as far as the church, that, that, that for me is, I don't know if churches can, <laughs> I'm sorry. I really, you know, in personal experience, I haven't been able to find that. And, you know, and I'm already an older person, but I still sometimes feel like the little prick, little something inside where I feel, eh, pina. How do you say spina in English? Please, somebody help me. A thorn, a thorn that pierces my soul, that gets to me sometimes. And really, sometimes it's hard to hold back the tears. And you think, man, get over it. But it's very, very difficult. And it's very profound. That's why Santa Muerte for me is so interesting. Because she truly is transgressive. And she is tricky in many ways. However, the role that she plays in the borderlands 
for a particular group of people has to be acknowledged. And that's what I'm going to do tomorrow. So I hope you join me. Daisy, each year um, we come up, well, we. Shatika comes up with um, working with a designer, the poster for the lectureship. And it is our tradition to have that poster framed and presented to the lecturer. And this year, oh, my, beautiful. I hadn't seen it. we hoped you hadn't noticed it as you were going through the beautiful. hall. We are um, concluded for the lecture portion tonight, but please, there is plenty of food and drink in the reading room, just on the other side of this wall. See you tomorrow morning at 10. <laughs>